All right, everybody. Um, this video is just me going to kind of do some voiceover um, for the gas free response practice number two. Okay, so the answer key is posted. It's in a PowerPoint form. Um, so you can look at that PowerPoint and see it. But I, I, I want to... Um, I want to kind of go through it with you and so you can hear me explain uh, what's going on, explain the calculations. So, um, you know, uh, many of you will just need to look at the PowerPoint so you can just look at the PowerPoint to um, understand what's going on. But if you need more of an explanation, um, then that's why I'm making this video. So all I'm gonna do is show the PowerPoint and kind of voice over the PowerPoint um, and explain different things. But, um, uh, but you know, hopefully you find it beneficial. Um, so you'll need a copy of the free response practice number two. Okay, you'll need a copy of that to kind of follow along. Um, so hopefully you're working on that. You've you've looked at it, so you understand what the questions are. All right. So I'll kind of go back and forth from the PowerPoint to the Word document um, to. Uh, to show you what's going on, but it would be beneficial for you to have that, those questions out and kind of follow along as we go. All right, so let's get to it. All right, so again, uh, gas free response practice number two. Um, these are the questions, so having this out will be beneficial. All right, um, but let's just go through it. All right, so first question, we have an aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide. Um, and the mass of the solution is 6.951 grams. So that's the mass of the solution, okay? Um, so that's not the mass of H2O2. That's the mass of the solution. So let's understand what that means. It doesn't mean this isn't all hydrogen peroxide. This is the mass of hydrogen peroxide plus water. It's the mass of the solution. All right, so so not all of this is H2O2, all right? But the H2O2 that is in the solution will undergo this reaction and produce more water and oxygen gas, okay? So the H2O2 in the solution decomposes completely according to the reaction above. So all of the H2O2 which was in this solution has uh, decomposed into form water and oxygen, but again, that's not how much H2O2 you start with. That's how much H2O2 and water you start with. So you don't know how much of this is actually H2O2, all right? And maybe that's what we're gonna figure out later on in the question, but let's understand that, all right? Um, so the O2 gas produced is collected in, in an inverted graduated tube over water, okay? So that's key, all right, over water. Remember, when we collect a gas over water, you have to subtract the water vapor from the total pressure to get the pressure of just the gas. So let's try to understand what we're doing. We're collecting oxygen gas, but the gas that is in the container that's being, uh, that the oxygen gas is being collected in also contains H2O gas as well, because some of the water will evaporate, okay? So we're given the temperature, um, we're given the volume of all the gas collected. Now remember, that's volume of O2 and H2O2 gas, okay? Um, and then when the water levels inside and out, uh, when the water levels inside and out are the same, and what does that mean? That means the external pressure, the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure inside the tube. Okay, so the total pressure inside the tube is equal to the atmospheric pressure. And then, oh, by the way, for some strange reason, and it's not a strange reason, it's always going to be given to you if you collect a gas over water, you will always be given the vapor pressure of water at the same temperature, which they give you. Okay, so the first thing they, they say is col uh, collect or calculate, sorry, uh, the partial pressure of just oxygen gas. So remember, this pressure is the pressure of oxygen gas and H2O2 gas, all right? So how do we find the pressure of oxygen gas? That's easy, we subtract, all right? So 
the pressure of oxygen would be the total pressure, which we know is the same as the atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, oops. Let me make this bigger. Right. So we know it's the same as the atmospheric pressure because we were told the water levels were the same. And we would subtract the pressure of water. And we were given that, right? So this was the total pressure. This was the vapor pressure of water. They were the same unit, tor and tor, so we can subtract. And so we get, we get our partial pressure of oxygen. Now, remember, when we subtract, it's about decimal places. So we are allowed that 0, 0.0 there. So if you want to be a stickler about sig digs, uh, we would be allowed four sig digs for that answer because we'd allowed one decimal place. All right? OK, so let's go back. Let's keep going. Calculate the number of moles of oxygen. So now we have the pressure. Whoops. Uh, now we have the pressure of just oxygen, and the other things that were given volume. All right. We were given the volume, and we were given the temperature, and so we can use uh, this pressure, and we can plug it into the ideal gas law to find moles. All right. So the temperature. Remember, it's not the twenty-three point four. Right. It's you got to add that to 273. So we would say uh, N equals PV over RT. And so again, the pressure, um, and let's, let's be careful here. The pressure was in TOR. So that's the pressure we would plug in. Um, the volume was, we got to be careful, was 182.4 milliliters, but you wouldn't plug that in. You would plug in 0.182 liters. You got to be in liters. Okay, and then you'd have to add 273 to this to get your temperature in Kelvin. Now, the other thing is tricky. Uh, whoops. The other thing that's tricky is our pressure was in TOR that we plugged in here. So, we could either convert that to atmospheres and plug in atmospheres and then use 0 0.08206 for our R value. But if we leave it in TOR, remember there's another R value on your formula sheet and that's um, uh, 62.36. And that's the R value you use if you're in TOR or millimeters of mercury, which is the same thing. So you plug in 62.36 there and keep your pressure in TOR and you get your moles of oxygen gas. All right. Whoops. So that's how many moles of oxygen gas that were produced. And remember, all of that oxygen came from the hydrogen peroxide in a two to one ratio. So now to calculate the grams of H2O2 that actually decomposed, we would take our moles of oxygen gas, multiply by two over one to get moles of H2O2. And then we would multiply by the molar mass of H2O2, which is what, 34.02. Right, we calculate that using our periodic table. All right, so if we do that, um, we would we get our grams of H2O2. So, you know, check your stoichiometry and see if you get the same thing. But that would be the answer there. All right. keep doing that that's annoying all right um, so all right um, now if we wanted to calculate uh, the percent by mass now we would just take this mass that we calculated in part C and divide it by the total mass times 100 all right so that's pretty simple um, and so it comes out to be 7.15 percent okay when you do it that way all right so next question is just kind of a blast from the past from last unit so just remember, this always comes up on the AP exam. And, and these questions are old AP exam questions. So it's not like, um, you know, this isn't, you know, I'm not warning you for no reason, right? This is important. Remember, oxygen's oxidation state in this molecule is minus one, not minus two. So minus one for the oxidation state here, and this is elemental oxygen, so zero. Okay. Keep doing that. <laughs> so... The oxidation state for uh, oxygen and hydrogen peroxide is minus one. Hopefully you remember that. And oxygen element, it's zero. Okay, great. And then it says balance the half reaction. So remember, this is a half reaction. Whoops. So, and it's um, it's a reduction, or sorry, an oxidation half reaction because we're going from minus one to zero. So uh, when you balance a half reaction, you will have electrons in the equation. So this is a balanced oxidation half reaction. So remember, um, 
this would be the oxidation half, okay? And what we would do is add, uh, we don't have to add any water because the oxygen's balanced. Uh, we would add two H pluses to balance the hydrogen and uh, then two electrons um, to balance the charge. All right, so it only wanted the oxidation half reaction. All right, this is the overall redox reaction here, but it only wanted the oxidation half, not the reduction half. Okay. So again, that would be your answer there. Okay. All right, so let's keep on rolling here. Question two, uh, it's asking us to answer the questions about carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Assume that both exhibit ideal behavior. There we go. So they're behaving like an ideal gas, meaning we can ignore particle volume and no intermolecular forces, right? Uh, so first question is just draw the dot structures of CO and CO2. So hopefully we can do that. And we remember that from unit one. second okay so um the dot structures uh co2 would look something like that um you know you should draw it linear um but two double bonds two lone pairs on the oxygens uh more accurately you you know maybe draw the lone pairs on a diagonal right and then uh this would be the dot structure for um co triple bond and you don't need the bond length there it's just that's the picture i found on the internet okay uh the shapes of both molecules are linear okay so hopefully we remember how to get the shape uh what's the hybridization of the carbon here two bonding domains so if they ask for hybridization of this carbon atom we would say sp if they ask for the hybridization of the oxygen in the co2 right one two three domains so sp2 okay so again, cumulative course, hopefully we remember how to do that. And uh, we have a uh, linear molecule there for part B, okay? Um, so part C, it's just asking uh, one, uh, one mole of CO gas is heated at a constant pressure. On the graph below sketch, the expected plot of volume versus temperature as the gas is heated. So we gotta remember that volume and temperature have a direct relationship um, and so it would be a positive sloping straight line so that's really all you would have to sketch there okay uh, if it was an inverse relationship remember that would be kind of a curved line so maybe if this was pressure and volume for some reason they asked you that one you wouldn't draw a straight negative sloping line it would be a curved kind of an exponential decay curve okay uh, let's keep on rolling. All right. So it says samples of CO gas and CO2 gas are placed in one liter containers at the, these conditions. So the, the, con, uh, the volume is the same. Okay. Notice the temperature is the same. So same average kinetic energy. And, but the pressures are different. Okay. So let's think about this. Same volume, same temperature. So we know same average kinetic energy. So same average kinetic energy, does that mean same speed? No, that means CO2 is gonna be moving slower on average than CO because CO2 has a greater mass per, mo uh, per molecule, right? But also different pressures. If they had the same pressure, that would tell us same number of moles of gas, but different pressures, not the same number of moles of gas. So two atmospheres versus one atmosphere, this has double the moles of gas. The CO container has double the moles of gas of CO2, and that's how you get two atmospheres versus one atmosphere, right? Okay, so let's, uh, uh, so, you know, we can conclude all of that just by looking at the picture here and the scenario. So let's answer the questions. Uh, indicate whether the average kinetic energy of CO2 is greater than, equal to, or less than. Uh, we would say equal to, and your justification would be same temperature. That's all you would have to say. They're at the same temperature, equal. Both samples are at the same temperature. Done, finished, that's all I have to say. Don't write an essay, okay? So that's that first part. Uh, indicate whether the root mean square speed, you might go, what, what is that? Just the average speed, just think of it the average speed. It doesn't matter, root mean square, average speed, most probable speed, who cares? 
we know that CO is faster than CO2 because that, in order to have the same average kinetic energy, CO has to um, be moving faster. So it's asking, is the CO2 molecules faster um, than the CO? And or is, uh, is the root mean square speed greater than, less than, or equal to CO? And we would say less than because CO2 is heavier. So less than. They have the same average kinetic energy, therefore the gas with the larger molar mass, or you could say molecular mass, same number, different unit, right? Would have a slower uh, velocity, slower speed, all right? All right, and then indicate whether the number of CO2 molecules is greater than, equal to, or less than, and we would say less than because we noticed that the pressure was less than that pressure. So if they had equal pressures, it would be equal, if the CO2 had greater pressure, CO2 would have more molecules, but because the CO um, has a higher pressure in the same volume, same temperature, higher pressure, that means greater moles of gas. Okay, So the answer to part three there would be less than at the same temperature and volume, the gas with the lower pressure would have less particles in the sample. Okay. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you. All right, let's go to number three. All right, so a rigid, so that's going to tell you that the volume stays constant. Rigid five liter cylinder container has 24.5 grams of nitrogen and 28 grams of oxygen. We want to calculate the total pressure in atmospheres of gas mixture. So what we could do is PV equals NRT, and it doesn't matter if you have moles of oxygen, moles of nitrogen, moles of both, all you need the N there needs to be total moles of gas. So what we have to do is convert our total moles. We got to convert grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen, convert grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen, and add those up, and that would be total moles of gas. And then we would have our N value, moles of gas. We would have our volume value. We have our temperature value. R is a constant, so we could solve for atmospheres. So we would have to get moles of nitrogen. So I get moles of nitrogen. I get moles of oxygen. Notice they're about the same number, okay? So they kind of will have equal partial pressures. Uh, so I get my total moles. And if I plug that into Pivnert, that would be my N value in Pivnert. Uh, it was 298 Kelvin. Uh, it was five liters. And um, I'm solving for P, so P equals NRT over V. And the R value I would use because they asked for atmospheres, because they asked for atmospheres, the R value I would use is 0 0.08206. And I get my pressure 8.55 atmospheres there. All right. Let's keep on rolling. Okay, the temperature of the gas mixture in the cylinder is decreased by two to 280 Kelvin. Calculate each of the following. The mole fraction of nitrogen in the cylinder, okay? The partial pressure of nitrogen in the cylinder. Well, okay, so here's the deal. The mole fraction is just 0.5 basically because it was half and half, right? We had equal moles of each gas essentially. So mole fraction would be 0.5. All mole fraction is is Moles, uh, so if I want mole fraction of nitrogen, it would be moles of nitrogen divided by total moles. Okay, um, so let's do that. Whoops. Okay. So again, if you just said 0.5, you're going to be fine there. Um, but because of rounding and all that stuff, it, it's a little bit less, but 0.498, but you know, okay, 0.5 basically. All right, so the mole fraction is around 0.5. All right, two ways to solve this. Uh, we could take our moles of just nitrogen, okay? And um, we have to understand that uh, the pressure, or sorry, the, the um, temperature decreased, so the pressure is going to go down. The volume stays the same because it's a rigid container. Um, so if we just, remember, we calculated moles of nitrogen initially, right? So if we just use that number of moles of nitrogen and plug it into Pivner with the new temperature, uh, with 280 Kelvin here instead of 298, and we solve for P, that would give us a partial pressure. Or we could take our total moles and solve for the new pressure at, um, at 280, 
Or we could do uh, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 uh, and solve for the new total pressure and then just multiply that total pressure by the mole fraction. Okay, so mole fraction of nitrogen times total pressure would give you uh, your partial pressure. So, um, so the new partial pressure of nitrogen is around four atmospheres. Okay. So if the cylinder develops a pinhole-sized leak and some of the gas mixture escapes, so remember the, the word for that, gas escaping through a tiny hole, is called effusion, okay? Um, what would happen to this ratio? Would it increase, decrease, or remain the same? So the question is, which gas effuses faster? And remember, it's always the lighter gas. So what gas, so if they had the same mass, uh, the same molar mass, the same molecule mass, uh, they would effuse at the same rate and this ratio would not change. But because nitrogen's lighter, it's going to effuse faster. So the amount of nitrogen is going to decrease faster than the amount of oxygen. So this ratio would decrease. Okay, because again, you're going to lose nitrogen faster than oxygen because it diffuses faster. Why? Because it has a, because you're at the same temperature, same average kinetic energy, but these particles are moving faster. So they're going to escape faster. Okay. So the answer would be decreased. The N2 molecules have a lower molecular mass, therefore they would effuse faster than O2, so the amount of N2 would decrease faster than the amount of O2. So that ratio, N2 over O2, would decrease. If it was O2 over N2, then that ratio would increase. And if they had the same mass, so they would effuse at the same rate, then that ratio would stay the same. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's go here. So a different rigid container, I have a different rigid container, all right, five liters, uh, a five liter cylinder, okay, same volume, but just a different container, starts out with 0.16 moles of NO gas, okay, at 298 Kelvin. A 0.16 mole sample of O2 gas is added to the cylinder, where a reaction occurs to produce NO2 gas, okay, write the balanced equation, all right, so NO, uh, plus O2 yields NO2, right? So NO plus O2 yields NO2, so to balance it, two here and two here, okay? So that's just our balanced reaction there, okay? Calculate the total pressure in atmospheres in the cylinder at 298 Kelvin after the reaction is complete. All right, so we have to figure out how many moles of gas are still in the container. And then once we have moles of gas, in the container after the reaction goes to completion, right? We'll have five, we have our volume, and we have our temperature, and we'll have our moles of gas so we can calculate the pressure, right? So that's our goal. But what we have to understand is, right, we start with point, what was it? Um, sorry, uh, 0.176 moles of NO and 0.176 moles of O2. So we start with equal moles of our reactants. All right. But let's think about that. They don't react in a one to one ratio, right? They don't react in a one to one ratio. Okay. So that means this is a limiting reactant question. All right. So which one are we going to lose more of? All right. We're going to run out of this. You need two of these for every one of those. So you're still going to have oxygen gas there. So all the N, uh, two NO will become, or all, all the NO gas will become NO2 gas. So we're going to end up with point, what, 0.176 moles of this gas, but we're still going to have some oxygen left over. So what we have to do is figure out how many moles of oxygen we have left over, add it to the amount of this that we produced, and that would be total moles that um, are still in the solution. Or sorry, it's not a solution, it's still in the container, right? Okay, so it's limiting reactants to figure out how many moles of product can be produced, okay? Then figure out how many moles of excess reactants still remain and get total moles. Plug it into PivNert and solve for P. So again, if we go back to the question, we're going to end up not having any more moles of this, but we're going to have that number of moles of NO2 gas. So we're going to have 0.176 moles of NO2, and we're going to have half this amount of oxygen. 
So if we divide this number by two and add it to that number, because that's the moles of NO2 we have, that would be the total moles that I plug in. I have my temperature, I have my volume. So I plug it into PivNerd, I solve for P. So give it a try and you should get that answer. Okay. All right. Moving on. All right, so we have another uh, question where notice we're collecting a gas over water and notice that for some reason they gave us the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at the same temperature. What does that mean? It means take the total pressure because notice the water levels are even. Take the total pressure because that's the pressure outside in the atmosphere but that would also be equal to the pressure inside the tube and that's the total pressure of all the gas being collected and if we subtract the pressure of the water then what's left? The pressure of the gas we're collecting. So the gas we're collecting is hydrogen. Okay. All right. So moles of hydrogen gas collected. So the first thing I want to do is figure out the pressure just due to hydrogen. I would plug that into Pivner and solve for N. Okay. So this would be the pressure that I plug into Pivner. Okay. Because that's the pressure of just the hydrogen gas. So that would go in for P of what would be, what was volume? Volume would be 0 0.09 liters, 0 0.09 liters, that's our volume. And our temperature would be 298, 298 Kelvin. Now notice our R value is going to change. It's not going to be 0 0.08206, it's going to be 62.36 because our pressure is in millimeters of mercury or torr, which is the same thing. And so when you solve, you should get 0 0.00349 moles. Okay, great. Calculate the number of molecules of water vapor in the gas sample. Okay, well, here was the pressure of just the water. So if we, we could use that in Pivner for our pressure, use the pressure of just the water, the partial pressure of the water, solve for moles, and then moles times Avogadro's number to get total molecules. All right, so, right. We would take the vapor pressure of water, which was the 23 something, plug that in for the pressure, solve for moles of gas. Everything else is the same. The volume is 0 0.09, right? The temperature is 298. We um, solve for N moles, and then we multiply by Avogadro's number to get molecules of water. Okay, moving along. The gaseous water molecules are moving at a rate of 2.5 meters per second. At what velocity is the hydrogen molecules? Movie. Okay, so this is when we're going to use Graham's law. So rate one over rate two equals the square root of the molar mass of, of gas two over the molar mass, square root of the molar mass of gas one. All right, so um, we know the hydrogen molecules should be uh, at a faster rate because they're lighter. Okay, so what we would do is uh, the rate of hydrogen would be our unknown x, and we would say, I, I would say x over 2.5 equals the square root of 18, which is the molar mass of water, over the square root of two, which is the molar mass of hydrogen. So that's how we would set it up and we would solve for X and that would be our answer. All right, so let's see if we got it. Use Graham's law, all right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm gonna have you go look it up because we talked about it in class. You need to know what we're doing here. But you should get 7.5 meters per second, all right. Which of the two gases would deviate most from ideal behavior? Remember, we're not told we're at an extreme low temperature or an extreme high pressure. So whenever you're asked which gas deviates the most, it's really just asking which one has stronger IMFs. And so in this case, obviously the water because it's polar and has hydrogen bonding, but uh, hydrogen only has one very, very, because it's only two electrons, very, very weak London dispersion forces. So the stronger IMF's gas will deviate the most. Whoops. All right, so the answer to the last question there. We know H2O gas would, gases with strong IMFs tend to deviate from ideal behavior, right? Because we're saying collisions are elastic, but the, more, the stronger the IMFs, the, the less we can actually ignore IMFs, right? Okay. So hopefully that helped you answer those questions. If you feel good about all that, then you are in great shape for this part of unit two, um, or sorry, unit three. Uh, and 
next week we'll be moving on to heat and enthalpy, which is the second part of unit three. All right, so all right, have a great one. Thanks for watching. As always, smash that like button.